I played a ton of video games in 2022. Most were incredible, some were middling, and a few were, yeah, yeah, they bummed me out a bit. They may not have been absolute catastrophes, and some may have been fun, but managed to make mistakes that even I, an internal optimist, did notice. Unlike years past, I wasn't ever actively seeking out a bad game. Most years, I spend my time trying to find the bad ones to make this video as clickbaity but truthful as possible, right? However, in 2022, I had a lot of other things going on in my life, and a lot of it was stressful, embarrassing, humiliating, depressing, and I just said, you know, what? I don't need to really think about bad games this year. So if you're looking for a video of me dunking on really easy targets that everyone else is doing, yeah, this video will somehow kind of fit that box, but at the same time, you'll have to look a little bit elsewhere. You see, these are all games that I was looking forward to, but somehow along the way, things went very, very wrong. So this video is called my top worst games of 2022, but it really should be called my top most disappointing games because each of these games on this list should have got me hyped. I wanted to love them. They are my kind of games and what I got was severely disappointing. So just know that going into this, there's maybe two on this list that are truly, truly bad. The rest, I'm just very, very disappointed in. Number seven. When Pokemon Sword and Shield released, there was a lot of controversy over the graphics, specifically this tree here. A group of very vocal fans said that it would look awful and visually compared it to Breath of the Wild. However, that never really bugged me. I loved the new Pokemon game. The wild area was amazing. The gym experience was very unique. I had a great time with Sword and Shield. And truth be told, when it comes to Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, I had the exact same feeling. But this time, I can't let the Pokemon company get away with this. Before I go any deeper, I have to talk about my experience with the game so far. I'm having a great time with it. It's very fun. I'm doing this fun challenge where my audience on Twitch is helping me make a living Dex before I leave the wild area. It's just a fun little challenge because I always complete these games and I wanted things to be different. So as of right now, I haven't really experienced the story or any of the school elements. But what I can say is that it still plays like the current generation of Pokemon we all know and love. AKA, the new Pokemon are awesome, the new mechanics are interesting, the game looks and runs terribly. Like a nervous kindergartner who didn't study their lines for a school play, Scarlet and Violet has performance issues all over the place. Only Pokemon isn't in its kindergarten stage. It's 24 damn years old. When running around the open world, there are times that the frame rate will just drop drastically, making traveling on foot a slog and other graphical glitches. Now, I haven't experienced the whole ton of them, but I can't count the amount of times I've seen Pokemon walk through walls or go around invisible things during a battle. But what's worse are the things that aren't glitches and are just lazy, like watching students walk through a battle. Look, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is the first entry here because this game is incredibly fun and is still very different when it comes to the Pokemon formula that they are trying to modernize. Overall, I've really loved my experience catching these little monsters and doing my best to get shinies to give to my girlfriend. But these graphical issues and low frame rates are seriously inexcusable. The bummer in all of this is that it really feels like the Pokemon company isn't going to change anything about any of this anytime soon. Number six. Look, I love scary action games. Some of my favorites are the first two Dead Space titles. The desolate sci-fi setting, terrifying creature designs, and a surprisingly sympathetic protagonist made for a unique experience that could only happen in video games. And even though the third game was disappointing, eventually I was given hope by Callisto Protocol, a game that was so similar that it even had the same team who worked on the original games. And I've gotta say, in the end, this is a game that was not ready to come out of the oven. It starts off with some awesome high octane sequences and stellar performances by the cast, but soon Callisto Protocol becomes repetitive and boring. Melee combat is actually kind of similar to Punch-Out. Dodge, sometimes monsters attack, hit them a few times, repeat. This is novel at first, but this system is both difficult to master and gets stale when repeating the same pattern for hours on end. Beyond lackluster combat variety, there are a lot of stealth sequences where you either succeed or die, resulting in overly grisly death animations. Now, I normally have a stomach for these kinds of things, but they're often so drowned out and gruesome that it goes from scary to gross and takes away from playing the game. But the nail in the coffin for me, because I'm the completionist, is the collectibles. This game is extremely linear and lacks even a chapter select, so collectibles are easy to miss on our first pass. And in my playthrough for the show, some collectibles just disappeared if I died right after grabbing them. Some didn't even spawn. 
Fortunately, I played Callisto Protocol on the PS5 and not the PC, where a majority of the issues were there and they were a lot worse. The big takeaway from all of this is that Callisto Protocol is really fun for the first quarter of the game. The world building and presentation are great, and the combat is fun at first. However, the rest of it just feels like an average action game instead of the desolate horror classic I hoped it would be. Now, there have been some updates to address some bugs and glitches and add quality of life improvements, so maybe this game won't be on your lists. But as far as 2022 goes, the year the game came out in, and the state that it was released in, this game is right here. Again, going back to the whole idea of this whole list, it was extremely disappointing from what we got with Callisto Protocol and I hope for a brighter future for their next title. And hey, shoutouts to YouTube for practically ruining my video on Callisto Protocol because it got instantly demonetized after I stayed up for a week straight writing, completing, and making the video. So hey, if you wanna watch my video and give me some views, I'd appreciate that. If not, no big deal. Number five. I'll say it again, and again, and again. Mario Strikers is Nintendo's most underrated franchise. The first game looked like nothing else Nintendo had made before it, and Charged on the Nintendo Wii is easily one of my favorite multiplayer experiences. The chaos and strategy implemented on the field always made a goal so exhilarating, which is why it's so beyond disappointing that Mario Strikers Battle League felt so lifeless at launch. Let's just look at the numbers real quick, okay? When it was released, Battle League had 10 playable characters, five stadiums, and 12 cups. These numbers have changed, however, with the last of three free updates released throughout the year, adding a total of six new characters and three stadiums. And yes, more is more, but these free DLC drops feel like consolation prizes, but never added new game modes, which Battle League desperately needed. Instead of new gameplay modes, the big new shiny attraction to Battle League is customization offered with a split stadium mechanic and character gear. Combining two different fields to play on at the same time is conceptually exciting, but sadly, all stage hazards have been removed from stadiums, so stadiums are nothing more than cosmetic flair. Yes, you can customize equipment for your team to alter their stats, which allows for some deep and nuanced builds, but it seems like this was done at perhaps the cost of the expected mayhem of strikers. Now, I'm not here to build the best footballer. I'm here to see Diddy Kong become a god and score a goal during the most chaotic soccer match of all time. Sadly, we have a very neutered strikers experience that's a little more than a glorified online demo that was marketed and charged as a full game. Never thought I'd have two different Nintendo games that were on this list this year. Maybe this is the year, guys. The year that I stopped loving Nintendo. Nah, who am I kidding? Number four. All right, so I'm breaking one of my usual yearly rules in that I will not allow remakes to be on one of these two lists. I'm breaking that rule because the House of the Dead remake was very disappointing. House of the Dead is an arcade classic that I've always loved. It has fun with copyright presentation, wonderfully bad voice acting, and it is a blast to play whether you're shooting zombies with a light gun or computer keyboard. We even have a playable cabinet here in the office. That's how much I love this game. Well, a remake was released in 2022, and uh, it somehow captures none of what made the original great. Great. A lot of the presentation elements that made the original memorable are gone. The graphics aren't good enough to be compared to modern horror classics, but they aren't goofy enough to remind you of the original. It's also hard to tell when you get hurt since the blood marks on the screen get lost in the blood spurting out from enemies. Then there's the sound. The voice acting attempts to recreate the campiness from the first game. The score is completely new, however, since there were licensing issues with the original music. And I'm baffled just how far off they were with the mark on this one with these new arrangements. They're fine, but they don't even feel remotely the same. The most egregious issue is that there's no true light gun support, which seems like the very first thing you'd want to try and nail when making a light gun game. Instead, a modern control scheme has been slapped on this bad boy and to poor effect. Controls feel alarmingly sluggish for a game dependent on reaction time, especially against smaller and faster enemies. If you're playing on the Switch, you can thankfully use gyro aiming with the Joy-Cons, but things still don't feel well optimized. The fact that the House of the Dead remake didn't turn out all that well stings because the team behind it clearly had love for this game. A lot of things like the light gun or VR support got left behind for various reasons, which is usually code for time and money and publisher want game to go. If they had both of those, there's no doubt to me that we would have seen a much better product. Instead, we're left with something that felt dead on arrival. Number three. 
A good sequel should take the things that made the previous game and expand on them well. Look at Sonic 2 or Mario Galaxy 2. But when Blizzard released Overwatch 2, they weren't really looking for ways to improve the game, they just had dollar signs in their eyes. Overwatch 2 features minor gameplay changes compared to the original game. Teams were reduced from six members to five, one less tank, and environments were changed to have more cover. They even added a new mode where it was the player versus the environment, which, hey, not a bad idea, but the biggest changes come with how people pay for the game. Overwatch 2 gets rid of the loot box system from the first game in exchange for a free-to-play model. This means that you can experience and unlock most of the things that the game has to offer, like skins and other heroes. But if you want to get them immediately, you just have to buy the battle pass. This may not seem like a pay-to-win system, but the game is programmed in a way where certain characters are countered by others. And if you haven't unlocked them yet, then yeah, you're kind of at a massive disadvantage. But if you don't like the new free-to-play system, you can just play the original Overwatch and have fun there, right? Wrong. Though Blizzard initially said that both games would be able to run simultaneously, they instead chose to completely shut down the original Overwatch's servers, forcing players to update to this new game. There's no doubt about it, this change did not come from a place of wanting to improve the game. In our hearts and on paper, it was driven by greed. I get that Blizzard is a company that needs to make cash, but this is at the cost of player enjoyment. Number two. The last time Platinum Games and Square Enix worked together, they released Nier Automata, a game that's widely regarded as a classic and one of the best games of 2017. So when it was reported they were working together again on a multiplayer action RPG, fans were hyped. And yeah, I was too. However, when expectations are that high, it's very easy to fall into the crevices of disappointment. Such is the case of the appropriately named Babylon's Fall. Anyone will tell you that the last word to describe most of Platinum Games' titles is boring. There is a first time for everything. The combat starts off strong at first with fun combos and dodging, but quickly gets dull since enemies will only attack you one at a time. The game looks bland. It is bland. Some enemies have cool designs, the rest aren't anything special, and the environments are made up of empty fields or similar looking hallways. Once again, this is coming from a part of the same team that made Nier Automata and Bayonetta for God's sakes, some of the most unique looking games out there. But the crux of it all is that Babylon's Fall is a live service online game. This means that it's dependent on a lot of people playing the game at the same time. The most players this game ever had at once was only 1,166 people. And after two months, that number had dropped down to one person. Add on some unnecessary microtransactions, really, really god-awful customization options, and this is without a doubt one of the worst titles that Platinum Games has ever made. Number one. You know, it's been a whole entry since we've talked about a Blizzard title. And yes, this is the number one slot. Overwatch 2 got most of the attention recently. It wasn't the first time in 2022 they tried to screw over consumers for the sake of cash. So without further ado, my number one game of the year that is the worst, Diablo Immortal. A mobile entry in the classic dungeon crawler Diablo series, Diablo Immortal takes place in between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3. Combat has been massively stripped down so that dungeons are smaller and combat is simplified. Now this is disappointing, but it is understandable given that Immortal is meant to be played on mobile devices and not a PC setup even though you can obviously play the game on PC. It's very large with limited customization options, it is clear that you are playing a mobile port of a game on a PC. Granted, they could have updated the game since I last played it, but I put in a good probably 30 to 40 hours and I learned enough about the game. First and foremost, the scaling in the game is all over the place. Levels one through 20, you can get within the first hour to two of the game. Anything beyond that is a very, very slow crawl. The game's ecosystem is not completely dependent on having the best gear for the sake of PvE. But the game and its UI is consistently reminding you to spend money. The entire time you're playing, it's telling you, hey, this thing that you wanna get, you can earn it naturally or spend money to make this notification go away. I kid you not, it's notifications galore about spending money left and right. Diablo Immortal is yet another free to play game with a battle pass attached to it. And Blizzard gives that to you in the form of different seasons if you choose to pay for it. But the microtransactions really plague this entire experience. Hypothetically, if you don't want to play the game and just have the strongest possible character right off the bat, you can do that by spending money. It would cost you lots of money, but you can do that. 
And now I'm not sure if Blizzard listened to this feedback since then because this game has been out for a while, but if you choose to actually play the game, there were reports saying they could take up to 10 years to get to that level of awesomeness because of the randomized aspect of loot, luck, and the money you choose not to spend. Now, I don't know the numbers as of today, but the first 60 days of Diablo Immortal were incredibly successful. 10 plus million dollars for Blizzard to take to the bank. I spent my time, and I just hope that Diablo 4 coming later this year will show everyone that it's not all about that. It's not all about the money, especially because Diablo 2 Resurrected is an incredible title. So at the end of the day, it turns out that with all this exploitative systems, I'm not the only one thinking that Diablo Immortal can go to hell, being the worst game of the year in my eyes. The sad thing is, as a mobile game, it's actually pretty fun. So there we have it. Those are my top worst games of 2022. Let me know what other disappointing games I may have missed, especially if you have some hot takes. I'd love to hear a 2022 video game hot take. Leave in the comments below, and hey, I'll see you all next time. Bye bye